All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Silva. Um, <clears throat> I'm very pleased to have been asked to moderate today's symposium on next generation vaccines. Uh, we have a full slate of very interesting presentations today that'll be presented by recognized experts in the fields. Um, I wanna welcome symposium members from across the United States and abroad, and look forward to hearing the presentations and learning from them, as well as from the insightful questions that'll be asked. Uh, also, uh, during our what will hopefully be a lively roundtable discussion. We have three presentations that will be live today, and one is pre recorded. The speakers will have 15 minutes for their presentations, followed by 10 minutes for question and answers. I ask the audience participants to submit their questions in the QA box. And if we don't uh, get around to answering all of them during the scheduled presentation time, uh, they'll be responded to hopefully in the roundtable discussion or by the individual presenters on a one-on-one. -on -one. So with all that being said, I want to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Reeder. She's a senior research scientist from the U.S. Department of Agriculture at the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. Dr. Reeder has conducted F foot and mouth disease virus research for over 27 years. She's been actively engaged in several international collaborations with scientists from both FMDV endemic and FMDV free countries and has served as a scientific advisor since the creation of the Global Foot and Mouth Disease Research Alliance. So the title of Dr. Reader's presentation today is Novel Marker Vaccine Platforms for the Control of Foot and Mouth Disease. So Elizabeth, the podium is now yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Steve, for the uh, kind introduction and to the organizer for inviting me to present on our uh, uh, next generation FNDV uh, platform for the control of food and mouth disease. As um, just a brief introduction to, to the topic, um, I think uh, food and mouth disease is a very uh, impactful disease due to the large number of animals that are affected, uh, principally. Uh, cloven uh, hoof uh, animals, and also because of the uh, ample distribution uh, uh, on the seven uh, pools of food and mouth disease uh, seen here uh, on endemic countries uh, labeled in gray. And uh, you could see that these pools of food and mouth disease uh, contain uh, two, three, and up to five different serotypes in it. So um, within each of these uh, pools, uh, there is uh, uh, no cross protection between different serotypes and even within the same uh, serotype, uh, different topotypes not necessarily cover uh, each other. Uh, the cross protect protection is very limited. So this uh, problem in endemic countries uh, uh, bring uh, not only uh, difficulties with the produ pro productivity of uh, animals, and, and, but also um, limitations to trade uh, animals and, and their products, uh, causing a, a, a important uh, food security concerns. So the concerns are not only um, uh, related to, to the endemic countries, but also the disease-free countries um, uh, have concerns uh, due to the um, a natural or uh, in, in, in intended uh, introduction or incursions of the disease in their regions. So um, each of these global pools require a tailored vaccines to um, just uh, manage the control in this region. So they are ongoing uh, pool surveillance uh, and typing to support and guide um, the selection of vaccine for each uh, of these pools. So they are, um, although the, the current uh, chemically inactivated vaccine has been successfully used to control the disease uh, in many of the countries that now are free of the disease, uh, uh, with some examples here to the right, uh, there are still some limitations or concern uh, on this uh, current vaccine due to the use of large quantities that uh, require the growth of large volumes of uh, wild type virus with the potential risk of release from the manufacturing uh, facilities. Also, in terms of the um, rapidness to, to address new strains or emerging uh, strains. 
from the efficacy point of view, uh, these uh, vaccines um, uh, can um, uh, limit the, the sign of the of clinical signs, but are limited um, and not necessarily uh, limit uh, viremia shedding or uh, the establishment of the carrier stage. Uh, so that's why um, novel uh, vaccines are coming into place and efforts have been uh, put in, in recent years, actually for a long uh, 15 to 20 years to address some of the gaps of current vaccines uh, in terms of the uh, trying to provide a rapid and long-lasting protection, prevent vital transmission, uh, prevention of the carrier stage, and it's active research in all these areas. Today, I would like to uh, focus um, on our um, recently developed um, a vaccine, FNDV vaccine platform that, is address, uh, that addresses two of uh, these important gaps on, on uh, or, or limitations of current vaccines. And one is related to differentiation of infected from vaccinated animals or DIVA uh, cap cap capacities. And the second one would be uh, that uh, a vaccine that can be produced without the needs for virulent FNDV. So this platform has been now uh, presented in more details in uh, several publications. And I will um, now review some of the key features of it. Um, so this uh, vaccine uh, platform has been a collaborative effort in the development between uh, our lab uh, at Plum Island, depending on the USDA ARS, and in collaboration with our industrial partner, Soedis, uh, um, whose uh, principal investigator for the company is uh, John Parker. So the, um, the vaccine product or the finished vaccine consists on a uh, BI inactivated uh, whole virus formulated with a proprietary oil-based adjuvant. So this vaccine has uh, featured three important characteristics. One of them is uh, based on the cassette construction that uh, by means of swapping the capsid coding sequences, we could rapidly address um, emerging strains and uh, we have demonstrated derivation of viruses uh, for all seven serotypes this far. Um, the second characteristic is the safety and easy production technology. And this is based on uh, modification uh, conducted on the genome, where we have eliminated uh, the leader coding protein, uh, which is uh, a, a, an important virulent factor, and also uh, elimination of one of three B BPGs or three B peptides. So these two combined have uh, produced a virus uh, that is highly attenuated in the susceptible animal. Uh, and also uh, uh, is also um, uh, utilizing the current um, technology for uh, production of inactivated uh, FNDV. So um, that is uh, also already established. So it's simplified uh, process and, and uh, regulatory aspect of it. Um, so we have demonstrated, and I would show some uh, data on it uh, that is non-transmissible in cattle and swine, and it's also fully DIVA compatible. And that has been um, achieved by introducing two negative uh, markers in uh, two independent uh, coding regions in 3B and 3D. And uh, these um, have been stable maintained and uh, are now uh, utilized to track or, or, or monitor uh, the uh, animal responses uh, to the non-structured proteins uh, that in this case have been marked to be negative. So we'll um, also review some uh, data where we have uh, performed efficacy studies and show also um, in PD50 experiment that a potent immune response is uh, uh, elicited by this vaccine when formulated with a proprietary adjuvant. So in the next slide, I would just uh, review um, a number of experiments that we have uh, conducted to examine the safety of the virus. In this case, uh, we have tested uh, the live uh, vaccine uh, virus 
by inoculating in, in two susceptible species in cattle and, and pigs. And for a number of strains, we have tested um, uh, four different uh, route of uh, in inoculation, uh, interlingual, aerosol, aerosol and contact in cattle, and the highly sensitive uh, route of the heel bulb and contact uh, exposure in pigs. So this experiment has shown um, uh, that no clinical disease is evident in any of these immunities, uh, inoculated or infected anim animals. Uh, no uh, vir viral shedding, no spike of, of fever, no contact transmission. And due to the high um, attenuation of the strain, we could observe or not observe uh, uh, any immune response to the virus in this case. So this uh, set of data and other additional uh, more recently conducted has um, supported uh, the, uh, the exclusion uh, of, from the select agent uh, list in the US for this particular va vaccine uh, uh, platform strain. Um, and that uh, has uh, give, it, give us uh, about three years ago in 2018, the waiver to be able to work with this uh, FNDB leaderless marker uh, virus uh, in the US mainland. So next I'm going to just uh, review briefly a uh, two set of experiments um, that we have conducted uh, with a vaccine formulated with um, A24 Crusader. And in this uh, particular experiment, we have tested two um, candidates of, of, of proprietary adjuvant candidates uh, and compare them to a commercially type uh, vaccine uh, used as a reference. As you could see by the clinical uh, signs um, scored uh, given on the uh, right panel, you could see that both the commercial and the uh, vaccine formulated with proprietary adjuvant 2 uh, produce a complete um, a, a, a blockage of, of the clinical signs and, and no disease was evident in these uh, animals with the zero score. Um, we have selected then uh, to move forward with the, this um, adju adjuvant uh, number two. And on the uh, left panel, you could see the immune responses uh, that is uh, quite evident already by seven days. Uh, and then um, it continued over the time until the day 20 one when we did the, the challenge of the animal. So you could see that the adjuvant two um, not only uh, blocked the, the clinical sign, but also uh, induce a uh, potent and uh, robust uh, immune responses in, in this experiment. So the next experiment was a PD50, the protective dose 50 experiment. Uh, here we uh, tested uh, a full dose um, a one in quarter and one in 16, using two different uh, down, uh, downstream processes. And as you could see by the clinical signs uh, on the right pan panel, you could see that um, at all three doses, doses and, and uh, the two different downstream uh, processes, uh, no clinical signs were evident uh, in these vaccinated animals. Uh, in this case, uh, the formulation was A24 plus zero combined with the proprietary adjuvant number two. So um, this also uh, correlated with um, some uh, uh, limitations on the viremia, um, where we didn't observe, except for the control, uh, peak of viremia, and only one animal uh, at one time uh, presented a uh, a qPCR um, that was uh, on the borderline to be positive. So in addition to that, we look a little uh, farther into uh, uh, days after uh, the challenge, in particular at, at different times uh, follow, following a challenge for the for search, searching uh, virus in the oropharyngeal uh, cavity. And uh, there we could see that in these probank uh, samples taken um, for the full dose uh, under the two different uh, downstream processes, we uh, have uh, a very consistent um, a reduction and, and no presence of uh, um, persistent animals. So this briefly uh, summarized the result. 
on this uh, experiment. So we show that um, even at the one in 16 dose, uh, we found a high serum antibody titles uh, compared to the conventional, conventional vaccine, uh, com uh, complete prevention of FNDV lesions. Um, uh, the full dose uh, vaccine prevented uh, persistent infections. Uh, also, uh, we observe prevention of fever and viremia and significant redux reduction in shedding. So very importantly, I mentioned that this vaccine encode, uh, in, has inherent uh, negative markers uh, just uh, encoded in their genome. So we could monitor the responses in animals for the non-structured proteins uh, presence. And uh, in this case, we have utilized three different commercially available uh, tests, uh, the cryocheck, the BMRD, uh, and the Cerelisa. Uh, the BMRD is being one that we uh, helped develop uh, between efforts of the USDA, um, a Texas A&M, and a, a company. Uh, and as you could see here uh, on the red uh, bar, those are uh, the sera um, obtained from animals that had been vaccinated um, and then uh, collected at day 21. And you could see compared to the green um, bar, which is the uh, naive animals that received just a placebo, all these samples were negative, confirming uh, the DIVA capability, uh, full DIVA uh, capability of our vaccine. So the stage of uh, the art uh, on the development of this vaccine has been progressing from the proof of concept uh, conducted in uh, just uh, several years ago. Um, we move into the select agent exclusion that I mentioned about three years ago uh, with the production of full length construct and testing them for uh, safety and also efficacy. At the moment, we are under the full development uh, stage uh, of, of this platform in partnership with our, uh, with SOETIS, our industrial partner, uh, who is uh, currently establishing a transboundary and emerging disease vaccine development facility in College Station, Texas, in collaboration with Texas A&M uh, University. So the um, intention here is to um, uh, continue with process optimization, scaling up, preparation of pre-master seed and master seed, uh, and full development of, of all these um, new uh, strains and, and that would cover the needs for all global um, uh, pools of food and milk disease. So I would like to now, uh, in the last few minutes uh, that I have available, uh, review uh, something that is very um, pre preliminary, but very novel. And we have uh, just uh, a few years ago, just started into uh, these efforts uh, to enhance uh, cross protection. Um, by using uh, what we call the uh, FNDV mosaic vaccine platform. So the concept and principle for um, making this, this uh, capsid is that you basically come out with a complete uh, synthetic uh, a capsid or target antigen. In our case, what we targeted was the entire capsid of food and mouth disease. Um, using an algorithm that was developed originally by Los Alamos a national laboratory, and here are some um, of the seminal papers that describe this, this, um, this uh, methodology that basically is a computational methodology that take in consideration the sequence of a large uh, number of um, a FNDV uh, strains for the particular serotypes and come out uh, by means of this algorithm uh, with uh, two or three different uh, synthetic uh, antigen that when combined would provide uh, a ma a much broader um, a coverage. This uh, technology has been successfully used for other highly variable viruses like uh, HIV, flu, and, and hepatitis C. And, um, and, and basically the criteria is uh, to optimize coverage with a minimal redundancy. So uh, here at the bottom, I have just to exemplify how different these um, uh, antigens are from each other. I uh, just have a, uh, this predict 
predicted three-dimensional structure of uh, A24 Crucero protomers uh, compared to two mosaics for the type A, which is one of the serotypes uh, on FNDV that is uh, the most highly variable along with uh, SAT2. So as you could see, uh, this just represents some of the features on electrostatic and positive and negative charge residues. And you could see compared to A24, the two mosaics have unique features and different from each other. So these two uh, mosaics could complement. Um, so it used um, optimal coverage with minimal redundancy. So they would complement each other. So just to exemplify further this concept, if you would have taken just uh, the 18 4 Crucero and look at the coverage within a, the entire uh, a range of uh, FNDV within that serotype, you could see that uh, the coverage would um, allow for just virus that are closely related to, to A24 Crucero. The level of coverage uh, as more blue or darker blue, the more higher score it would have. So if uh, you see the next um, tree, uh, when uh, you uh, use this algorithm to create one uh, mosaic, you get a completely different uh, profile where you increase the coverage for more decently uh, related strains. Uh, A24 and one mosaic could uh, definitely improve uh, that coverage. And we have selected two mosaic, which is uh, the fourth um, displayed here uh, on this panel, uh, where the coverage um, is, is quite good with a minimal of uh, two um, a, a strains that complement each other. I'll show you briefly um, some results um, of uh, a challenge, a heterologous, heterologous challenge in an efficacy study um, using uh, these three virus, A24 Crucero, A uh, Saudi, and Iran uh, 05 uh, in the next slide. So basically, we have three groups uh, that were vaccinated with the um, mosaic virus. Um, vaccine, a, a bivalent uh, vaccine of, of mosaic type A. And one set of uh, uh, this group uh, were challenged at 21 days with A24 plus zero. Uh, the other two groups uh, received a boost at 21 days, 22 days, and then they were challenged at, uh, after this boost at 36 day post vaccination. As you could see in the summary uh, table at the bottom, um, we achieve 100% um, protection uh, on uh, these um, immunized uh, animals and not on the controls or that receive the placebo uh, using these three heterologous uh, challenges. So these promising uh, studies are now being expanded and we are looking into uh, B and, and cell responses to understand uh, their um, uh, the mechanism of, of protection in this case. So here are the neutralizing titles uh, to all three virus, the heterologous virus use for challenge. Um, and you could see that at seven days, we already have a, a significant neutralizing title to all three uh, challenge viruses. And that is even increased further when you do either the boost or the challenge with the viruses uh, in this case. Um, Furthermore, uh, we also look at 13 different um, type A viruses for, their for the neutralization capacity of the sera uh, generated by these um, vaccinated animals at 22 days post vaccination and after the boost. And uh, you could see here um, that is a robust um, induction of neutralizing titers to a variety of, of viruses. So with that, um, I would like to just um, complete my presentation by uh, first, I want to thank uh, our collaborators uh, at Ram Island and from Soedis for the, present the component of our uh, next generation vaccine, the leaderless um, 3B, 3D uh, vaccine. And uh, then uh, I want to thank here and acknowledge people uh, in my laboratory, um, especially Kathleen Plum, uh, Tatiana Seed and Ignacio Fernandez, Michael Oldakowski, and Joseph Gutkowska, um, and also <laughs> our collaborators in Los Alamos National uh, Lab, other members of the lab at Camaylan, and uh, the, the 
funding and support from DHS. With that, I would like to um, con conclude my presentation and answer any question that you may have. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Unfortunately, it went uh, significantly over the time allocation, so we're going to have to take all the questions, um, or most of them, I should say, in the um, roundtable discussion. And I do see in the question and answer box that you do have a number of them to address. So we'll just take one for now and say, how does this technology address duration of immunity? Is this able to extend the duration of immunity over the uh, current vaccines or not? I think we have, um, these are experiments that we still need to conduct. And we are uh, hoping uh, when uh, pre-master seed and uh, uh, vaccines are produced in, in, in our uh, partnership facility, uh, we'll be able and uh, more likely an NBAS uh, conduct this, this experiment. These are very expensive to conduct in a laboratory setting, uh, but we have some um, uh, encouraging results uh, based on the use of proprietary adjuvants that we selected that uh, will uh, definitely uh, be testing uh, those uh, when the times uh, became available. But these are uh, important uh, factors uh, or features that we would like to examine with our vaccine. Okay, well, um, thank you again for this presentation and uh, it's time now to um, move on to our, our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sandra Bloom. She's a senior scientist at the Friedrich Wolfer Institute and the Federal Research Institute for Animal Health in Germany. She's the deputy head of the Institute of Diagnostic Virology and is responsible for the National Reference Laboratories for Classical and African Swine Fever. She's also the deputy head of the Institute of Diagnostic Virology. And the title of Dr. Bloom's presentation today is African Swine Fever Virus Vaccines, Future Perspectives. So Sandra, podium is yours. So thanks, Dr. Jiri, to, uh, for the nice introduction and for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I would like to take you to a very complex disease and a complex question of the future perspective of vaccines against the disease. So African swine fever is truly an emerging infectious disease. And if we would not have COVID, we would probably call it the pandemic that we have um, at the moment. So if you look at the textbook, uh, you always see that the change in the geographical distribution is one of the features for something like an emerging infectious disease. And if you look into the old textbook, you will see that African swine fever was a disease that is present in Africa, mainly in many countries located south of the Sahara, in most of which the disease is endemic. The problem is if you look at the world map at the moment, it is no longer an African disease and is definitely not exotic anymore for most of um, the continents we have. You see here some of the headlines of the last days. So first African swine fever cases discovered in Malaysia, the livelihoods of millions in East and Southeast Asia at risk from swine fever epidemic. And also from my personal view, ASF in Germany, the number of white boar cases tops Belgium. Belgium had roughly 900 cases. We were now uh, way beyond uh, the thousand. So this explains why we have a demand for, for vaccines. And vaccinology for African swine fever is truly a problematic one. If we look into history, there has been history of using life attenuated vaccines, the conventional life attenuated vaccines, they were used in Portugal and Spain in the 1960s already, and they have caused a disaster in the end. So in the end, the cases went up, um, the vaccinated animals developed side effects, meaning uh, joint lesions and skin lesions that were more or less oozing the virus. And this gives you uh, the background to understand why we are all so cautious uh, about new uh, vaccines against African swine fever. Anyway, we want to have a vaccine. However, uh, in the, on the global scale, there are very different situations and the vaccines that we need for these situations 
could be different or the needs are different. We have now several regions in the world where we could call African swine fever an endemic disease. If we want to apply a vaccine over there, it's in the end to prevent economic losses, and it could be a first step uh, to eradicate the disease. Under these settings, um, safety is key, and there also has to be a bit of a cost benefit. So if we look at the situation, we have often talked about subunit vaccines for, um, for, for the domestic pigs or even uh, inactivated vaccines. Unfortunately, none of these very safe approaches yielded uh, really promising results. So if you look at the literature, the only thing that these kind of vaccines could confer was partial protection. In my lab, we have now reassessed uh, these approaches, both inactivated vaccines um, with, in the, in the end, irradiated vaccines, bioinactivated vaccines, whatever you like, putting them together with a strong adjuvant. And in the end, the most problematic is the vaccinees are even uh, in the end uh, more rapidly dead than the ones that you did not vaccinate. This is, of course, the worst case. So in the end, we would like to have a safe vaccine, but um, the safest ones, at least we can think of, are not working. They include DNA vaccines. In an epidemic situation, we are usually talking about emergency vaccinations to stop transmission. This is usually part of an er eradication plan. And at the moment, most of the countries talking about uh, vaccination uh, to slaughter, not vaccinate to live. In this situation, we would probably rather go for a rapid onset and a solid protection, even after one shot of the vaccination. And in this area, we would probably go for a live vaccine that is just more rapid than all the other approaches. But here, it could be a safety issue. At least for the Central European perspective, um, we would probably not easily go to vaccination of domestic pigs due to the trade restrictions. What we would really like to do is vaccinate these guys. We have an abundant wild boar population that is currently the main problem in most of the affected countries, including Germany. And if you have a problem in the wild boar population, you already encounter severe trade restrictions for the domestic pigs. And here we come to another problem. If we want to do bait vaccination of wildlife, here on the right-hand side is the CSF vaccine that was very um, successfully implemented. It has to be a live vaccine. And we want it safe, we want it efficacious, and you have to keep in mind, everything that we have in our hands now is a GMO, and you are going to set it free in the environment. So if you ask me, when do we have the vaccine ready? Uh, not tomorrow, because even if we have very promising candidates, before I set it loose in the wild, I would like to be pretty sure that it does not cause a problem. So what is actually the status quo? Safe and efficacious vaccines are still lacking. You can read headlines every week in newspapers, in pig progress, uh, in Chinese papers or what yet whatsoever. But at the moment, there is no real licensed vaccine that will fulfill the ideal vaccine um, demand or what we would call it an ideal vaccine. We have a problem. There is a simultaneous lack of well-established permanent cell lines that are sufficiently susceptible and that do not provoke additional adaptations to the viral genome that leads to over-attenuation and other problems. So we definitely have progress made over the last years, and I will briefly talk about it uh, in a couple of minutes, but we have definitely also um, severe obstacles. One of the major obstacles is um, the complexity of the virus and our lacking knowledge about the protective antigens. We also have the problem that neutralization capacity of antibodies is very limited. I come from classic swine fever, and if I talk about neutralization, I mean neutralization. You put serum and the virus, and the virus is completely neutralized. If you do the same with African swine fever, it just does not work at all. 
that you can show on a scientific base um, some neutralization capacities, but as I said, not comparable to classic swine fever, for example. ASFV is a master in immune modulation and evasion. And it is really problematic to, to get this uh, virus known to the immune system. But why do I think that we still have a vaccine or could have a vaccine? It's definitely the case that animals recovering from acute um, ASF are protected against challenge, especially with closely related strains. And that gives us hope that there can be a solution to it. These are some of the examples of recent uh, publications, recent or less recent, but in the end, what um, the most um, promising candidates share is that they are deletion mutants uh, done by homologous recombination. So they are GMOs, you have to keep that in mind, but usually you try to delete um, factors that um, help the virus to modulate the immune system in especially the interferon antagonists. I had in my hands actually a couple of uh, viruses from all over the world for comparative testing. And I can assure you that there are promising candidates, including the one from the USDA actually. So uh, we have promising results, but at the moment what we can show is efficacy where we have to go into is the safety aspects. And there are, as I said, promising candidates in Europe, in Asia, in, in the US. And um, most of the most, uh, the most promising ones are live vaccines. You see here on the bottom left that there are also approaches uh, going into the um, subunit vaccines or vectored vaccines. And um, in the end, you see it's already in the title, the pool of eight virally vectored antigens protect pigs against fatal disease. Does this sound for you like um, a vaccine that you would take for notifiable disease? Probably not because it is a really good step forward, but it's only protecting against fatal disease, not against transmission and so on. You also see here on the bottom right that we had or there was made progress uh, in terms of the uh, cell or cell lines, um, cells that can replicate the virus. There are also others. So if we put all these things together, we have to, for the first time, really a quite promising uh, situation and new vaccine candidates come up every day. The main problem that we also face is that we have rumors from China, not only rumors, but also facts, that um, inadequately um, done vaccine viruses are spreading, that they have been used illegally, and they cause a disease um, course that is chronic, looks more or less like PRS, and would definitely go in the direction of what I said for the uh, Portuguese and Spanish strains. So whenever we talk about African swine fever vaccines, we have to, to target and tackle these questions. And we have to guarantee that we are not causing a catastrophe when setting it loose uh, under field conditions. So we are, we hope, but we also have these rumors. So how is really the future coming up and what is the future we can talk about? And should we use actually the vaccines? Vaccination, in my opinion, must be embedded in an ASF control and prevention strategy. We often talk about vaccination as it would save or solve all the problems we have. This is definitely not the case. Vaccination is just one tool to control a disease. And we also have to talk about where vaccination uh, is an option. Just ask yourselves for the worldwide situation. For classic swine fever, we have um, the best vaccines of the world. Did we use them in epidemic situations in industrialized settings? Not at least in Central Europe. And also, for example, uh, your country would probably ask if it is really needed uh, to combat the disease. Also, with a very good vaccine, 
you can still do a lot of harm and you can also just, uh, yeah, in the end, if you cannot manage it, it will not help. There's a, the example of China again. CSF vaccines have been used there mandatorily, but um, in the end it was not, they were not able to completely control the disease. In the end, the vaccines will not replace the need for biosecurity, also behavior changes, improved management, as I said, good diagnostic approaches and culling measures. So in the end, what we need for ASF at the moment is we first have to talk about safety characteristics and minimum standards. And this also means that we have to sit together just uh, answering the question, what is acceptable? And what need a vaccine candidate or what should it show before we can call it a vaccine and before it can go for, for licensing? So we also should use the major candidates in different institutions. If you look at the moment at the scientific literature, you will see that um, the infection models, the, um, how the vaccine was administered, it varies across countries and it's very different. So we have to discuss how we could harmonize it. And there are also some GMO issues that have to be discussed at least for Germany, it is a very um, burning topic because GMO is something very difficult. And in the end, um, we have to address it. And as I said, bait vaccination of wild boar would require live vaccines. And here again, this is the most difficult part. And then there's a very easy question. How much perfection do we really need if we want to do emergency vaccination? And in the end, these questions we would like to discuss in um, an upcoming webinar. And I really would like to invite you if you are interested. Um, it's part, um, Lee, or it's a shared webinar from the Global African Swine Fever Research Alliance, which I am, or where I am part of the executive committee of the IABS, dealing more with the um, regulatory affairs and also star IDAS. So if you'd like to join, this is the link. Uh, we, it's, you can also find it on the website of the GARA. And as I said, we need strong collaboration. We need communication to go ahead with African swine fever uh, to control and eventually eradicate it. And with this, I already went to thank you. And I pay tribute to the GARA it's uh, in the end our network of um, the researchers around the globe. And here really all continents are represented. And um, if you work on ASF, I can only make you share this um, yeah, Global African Swine Fever Research Alliance. And with this, I thank you for the attention. Well, thank you, Sandra. That was a very interesting presentation. And as we wait for more uh, questions to uh, come into our Q and A box. I'll um, I'll start with the the whole GMO situation. You alluded to this a number of times. Do you what do you see as a, a way to overcome this, or do you have any ideas how to, to overcome this? Uh, we are currently preparing to ask for downgrading of the attenuated strains. So we already have uh, quite nice safety. Uh, profiles, and um, in the end, if we can, we can show that at least they are completely attenuated, they are not transmitted. We have examples from other viruses, including CSF, where we could convince the, um, the broader stakeholders that they are safe and we can, we can use them. There is still, at least for Europe, there is still uh, some reluctance to accept GMOs. This is more psychological than um, something that you can base on facts. But I think what we really have to do is we have to convey trust and uh, the trust can only be done if we, be, we are transparent and we keep up uh, the communication with the stakeholders. So you, probably the biggest impediment to licensing a vaccine, once you have one that's very safe and efficacious, you're still gonna to have to overcome that hurdle and that's probably gonna be the biggest hurdle. So, but you could still uh, license and sell it in other countries where this is a big problem, like in um, Southeast Asia, correct? 
That's correct. I mean, for, for Europe, you would go for licensing at the European Medicines Agency, the EMA. Um, also with them, we have to keep in contact because in the end, um, just try to license a vaccine that grows on primary cells. This is, um, this is already a, a big problem. And um, you know that uh, your colleagues went to Vietnam to get probably one of the, the most promising candidates licensed. And also there, it's, there is um, still the need for discussion. What do we really want to see? And what is acceptable uh, in terms of safety and also efficacy? Okay. Well, those look like healthy pigs in your background, but um, I had a question or a comment in the Q&A, and this person asked if you could please update the audience on the ASF crisis in China that's impacting the world economy and just political stability possibly too. So the headlines are not commonly brought to the public attention in the US news media. Uh, what do you have, how do you want to address that? Um, thanks for the question. It's a very complex one and also a more sensitive one. Uh, what, we, what we know that um, in China, the situation is still quite grave, um, despite the fact that in certain areas they, it's improving. Uh, one of the major problems at the moment is that um, we see uh, mutant viruses. It seems that we see two phenomena. It's one is the um, natural mutants um, that occur when you replicate the virus at like hell. So in the end, it's a more or less stable virus. But if you, yeah, you give it free room to, to replicate, there are changes towards um, attenuation. And this is already the case in China. There are publications coming on. It's very, very difficult to judge from outside because um, usually the full sequence are not, are not really shared. So you can only see what the, some stars in, in the internetic regions. But then we have the problem of the illegal vaccines. It seems that um, several vaccine strains are circulating and causing this PRS-like um, causes. They do reproductive failure, they do respiratory syndromes, and of course they are not so easy to spot. There we are also in, in a problem of diagnostics um, because you really have to to think about ASF if your animal has just reproductive failure. Um, it's not so difficult to spot it because these illegal vaccines usually still carry um, some uh, reporter cassettes, so you can target these. And they have, um, in the end, uh, deletions in the multigene families that are known uh, to be used for, for vaccine purposes. Um, overall, I think the situation is still improving a bit, but this, uh, especially the circulation of these new variants could um, give us a long-term problem. Well, you, you mentioned in your, uh, towards the end of your presentation, something about uh, you don't want your vaccine to um, cause harm. Were you referring to those vaccine constructs in that area of the world? Yeah. And, uh, and the history of um, Portugal and Spain, where we know that there was a problem. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, it's not going to be good for, we all see the degree of vaccine hesitancy and the COVID-19 in the human population. And uh, this would just be more fodder for anti-vaxxers, I suppose. So we hope that isn't the case. Yeah. So Sandra, thank you very much. That was a very interesting presentation. And um, I think that we'll, um, we have other questions in the Q&A box that we'll address during the um, roundtable discussion, okay? And I will answer them in the, in the box, yeah. Thank you. You can answer them in the box and maybe we'll, we'll bring them up again for discussion with the total audience, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, right, very good, thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> now we want to turn to our third speaker. This is Dr. David Wallace. He's a project manager for the Viral Vector Vaccines Unit in the Vaccines and Diagnostics Development Program at the Agricultural Research Council and Andastaport Veterinary Research Institute in South Africa. He's uh, an OIE reference laboratory expert on lumpy skin disease and recognized as an expert on Rift Valley fever. And the title of Dr. Wallace's presentation today is Lumpy Skin Disease Virus, a Versatile Vaccine Delivery Vector. 
So David, the podium is now yours. Uh, thank you, Professor Geary, and for everyone uh, present. I'll just try and get the presentation up and going. There we go. So thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to, to share a passion of mine for this disease and especially of, of its development over the last number of years as a, as a vaccine delivery uh, vector. So we're very remiss of me not to give a little bit of the background because I'm, I'm sure for many of you, you're not very familiar with the disease, although a number of you are. So I'm just gonna give a little bit of an overview of where it all kind of started from the research and characterization disease itself. And then some of the challenges that are faced in Africa, especially for developing farmers, and then moving on to what we're trying to do in this respect of developing the, the virus as a vaccine delivery vehicle vector, and then a bit of further reading for those who are interested. So it all began here at Honest to Put at the sort of beginning of the 20th century with the founder, Sir Arnold Tyler of the Honest to Put Veterinary Research Institute, officially in 1908 specifically for rinderpest and a bit to do with uh, African horse sickness, but then many other diseases as well. So this is the original uh, main building of Sir Arnold Tyler, opened in 1908. And this is pretty much what the same building looks like today. The campus, honest to put, really went, uh, underwent a lot of expansion and we're now covering almost all aspects of, of veterinary uh, diseases as far as research and diagnostics. We have a small amount of, of actual vaccine production here. Then just to the north of us, we realized the need for high containment facilities. So we have the BSL-3 labs where diseases like foot and mouth disease, African and classical swine fever and Rift Valley fever are worked with and where the, a lot of the animal work is also undertaken. Then just to the west of us, uh, with quite a few of the vaccines being developed at the Honest Put Veterinary Institute, the big vaccine factory now known as Honest to Put Biological Products was established. And then just across the main road uh, to the west of them, we have obviously a need for training veterinary students to become vets. And so the veterinary faculty was then established and it now forms part of the University of Pretoria. And then the latest addition to our uh, complex here at Honest to Put is the biotechnology platform. And this is where next generation sequencing is undertaken. And I am told it is one of the top facilities in Africa in this regard. So very basically in the, the viruses themselves, uh, lumpy skin disease virus falls within the Cabripox virinae genus of the pox viridae family. And along with the other two members, sheep pox and goat pox. We have performed the whole genome sequencing a number of years ago, and most of the genes are pretty well characterized. Though there's still a few which have a few question marks next to them, so they're always good research project potential uh, for these. Typical pox viruses are size a bit small, around 152 kilobases, but the housekeeping gene is pretty central with those genes involved in virulence and host immunomodulation towards the termini. We have also performed uh, full genome sequencing of quite a few of the vaccine strains and field isolates. And this is a typical uh, phylogenetic tree analysis of the genomes, including sheep and goat pox viruses. Of interest, of course, are these naturally occurring recombinant viruses now being picked up in, in some parts where the, the disease and the virus have recently uh, moved into. Then the disease itself. So this is quite a severe case of lumpy skin disease. And as the name suggests, these lumps or lesions covering the entire animal in severe cases, but in milder cases, there can be one or two lesions and sometimes almost no lesions at all. As the, the lesions are also internalized, these often cause major problems with, with, breathing, uh, with breathing. And so this uh, mucus uh, discharge and things can often be quite a problem. Then the, the lesions themselves or sit fast, often then erupt and fall off and leaving these open wounds. And that then leaves the animal susceptible to secondary bacterial infections. So that's one of the main ways we actually treat for the disease itself is, is antibiotics, but more for the secondary bacterial infections. These cause then permanent damage to the hides, reducing their value. Uh, other clinical signs uh, can then be also obviously fevers and, and can lead to abortions. 
Uh, sterility can also occur. This can be temporary or permanent in bulls and in cows, and that can cause major problems, especially to emerging farmers, which mainly have a couple of animals. And then interestingly enough, there's quite a bit of evidence over the last few years of the disease in wildlife, and we're picking up more and more in the springbok species uh, lesions, and we've isolated virus. Of course, the springbok is a particularly important animal, being our national animal in South Africa, and of course, the emblem of the world-famous champion rugby team. Global distribution it has expanded extremely rapidly in recent years, out of Africa in 89 to the Middle East, then northwards into Eastern Europe, uh, Balkans, and then very rapid spread uh, eastwards uh, across into China, and now much of Southern Asia, and the virus and the disease is not stopping. And so it's really also a very much global concern, much like uh, African swine fever, and even foot and mouth disease. So very quickly then the control, well, we are very fortunate with this disease as there are also very good uh, vaccines available, live attenuated. So the original one developed here at Ornstepoort in the 1960s is known as the OBP or Nettling vaccine. And we now have two recent additions to the, the fold, which are Southern African pro produced, but also then available in other outbreak regions where regulations uh, allow them to be used. And then these are just some of the other lumpy skin vaccines that are available across Africa and in the Middle East. And you can also note here that some of the vaccines use sheep or goat pox as the, the root or parental vaccine. And so these are basically heterologous vaccines. One of the interesting things that has occurred, especially in non-endemic regions where lumpy skin disease has recently uh, entered, is that where some of the vaccines are utilized, uh, the animals tend to show a more generalized but mild form of the disease upon vaccination. Uh, very mild lesions and these quite quickly resolve and this has been termed nettling disease. And now let's move on to the next generation lumpy skin vaccines. So this is a directive that was shown very recently at a, a talk which I attended as a webinar uh, last week for Rift Valley Fever in Uganda. And you can see who I've highlighted it says the directive is to encourage research into availing more efficacious, safe, and cost effective Rift Valley fever vaccines. And I'll come to this again in a moment. So, what are some of the challenges that are facing farmers, particularly in Africa, but many other places as well? Because that is the cost of vaccines. In Africa, we have many diseases present, requiring many vaccines. And because of the economics of the, the vaccines on the manufacturing side, these are often only available as high dose vaccines due to the packaging. And so these can be really a problem in the cost factor, especially for emerging farmers, where obviously finances is a major issue. Then we have the sporadic nature of diseases. This can be due to the seasonality, very much lumpy skin disease, being more typical in the rainy season when vector numbers tend to be high, and or cyclical nature. And this can also be like disease like Rift Valley fever. Anything between five and 20 years uh, can be when the perfect conditions are present for outbreaks. Access to vaccines. Many countries, especially look at East Africa, flooding is a major problem, poor road infrastructure, etc. Storage, also a big problem. Many of the vaccines require continuous cold chain maintenance. And that's often an issue, especially in rural areas. And so even where the vaccines are available, sometimes they're open, but not used fully, not stored properly at all. And then the vaccines are rendered uh, inefficient. And then also government support. Uh, many countries do support or have government programs that support the actual use of the vaccines, but quite a few don't. And that very much comes down to economics and the cost factors. So what is a potential solution? We've kind of touched on this already, I think, in Sandra's talk, and, and that is to develop affordable, a multi-pathogen or combination vaccines, which are stable, provide long-term protection, are easy to administer, and can be regional specific. And pox viruses as a, a vaccine uh, delivery vehicle actually can tick quite a few of these boxes. I'm sure most of us are very much aware of the use of vaccinia virus as a, as a rabies, delivery uh, vaccine, and of course, very successful in Central Europe and now in America and Canada as well. 
The great thing is that lumpy skin disease virus actually ticks many of these boxes as well. And why it's able to do this? Well, first of all, as a vector, we already have very good live attenuated vaccine available. It has been proven to be stable. It is safe and provides good immunity. There's a lot of flexibility within the virus genome. We are able to insert multiple genes at a number of different non-essential sites. We also have the potential to use it for multi-pathogen protection. So we have our targeted pathogens, which I just mentioned already, Rift Valley Fever and others will come to again in a moment. And we can include lumpy skin disease and sheep pox and goat pox protection, as I mentioned just now, referring to the live attenuated vaccines. Also, these have marker or diva potential to distinguish infected from vaccinated animals using various ELISA or rapid tests. And there's even the potential for use as a human uh, vaccine delivery vehicle. And in fact, the UCT has a patent on this for an HIV vaccine. So this is a cartoon which we developed a few years ago as part of a, a Canadian government funded project connected to this work, trying to illustrate this point. So on the left here, you can see the typical situation where we have some of the different really economically important diseases in Africa, where we have individual vaccines required for each disease. But on the right, what we are aiming towards is the use of then one vaccine able to protect the different animals against the respective diseases, which should result in a happier animal and a happier farm and a more prosperous farmer. So how do we go about doing this? Well, I've already mentioned that we have a good vaccine vector available in the form of the honest put vaccine, but we're also looking at various field strains because what we're trying to do is use a targeted gene knockout approach. We knock out some of those genes involved potentially in immunomodulation or even virulence. And the idea is to use that to generate a attenuated strain and then also to improve on the immune responses induced. I've mentioned already where we have various insertion sites available. Typically, we use the thymidine kinase gene of the virus successfully and looking at then knocking out various putative immunomodulatory genes. So a couple of the pathogens we've been targeting as important diseases in Africa, I mentioned Rift Valley fever, and the other is PPR or Pestis petites ruminans virus. So when we insert, of course, the protective uh, immunogens of these uh, viruses into the lumpy skin disease virus genome. What's important to note is here, because we don't have PPR in Southern Africa, we have constructs available that don't include the PPRG or PPRV genes, because for regulatory uh, uh, factors, these will not be allowed. So typically then we use the normal um, system of uh, homologous recombination to generate our recombinants. We have various marker genes for selection available. And the one we use uh, very successfully is the uh, enhanced uh, green fluorescent protein. And here you can see a picture under UV light of the early stage recombinant expressing the marker gene. Then once we have the, the virus and we uh, selection on cell culture close to uh, homogeneity, we then go to PCR to ensure that it is homogeneous. So on the left here, we have a number of foci that we've selected that appear to be homogeneous and we use PCR to target to see this is a, to confirm this. Um, and we see the, the large insertion product we have. On the right here, we have the controls, which are for wild type virus. And what we can see here in, in the recombinants, there is no evidence of the wild type band showing that these are indeed homogeneous and free of any parental virus. We then use techniques such as immunofluorescence to show that the inserted genes against the pathogens of interest are being expressed here, immunofluorescence, and again, the control on the left clearly seen the expression of, in our case, the Rift Valley fever glycoproteins. We then go to animal trials. Unfortunately, we don't have a good small animal model available for lumpy skin disease, not for lack of trying. Again, there's potential there. So in this, this experiment, we were, we were looking to see if we get the heterologous protection against sheep and goat pox, and we proved this very nicely. We then go for the other pathogens, such as Rift Valley fever in this case, and we look at cellular immune responses to see that we're getting good responses in that respect. We also then look at the humoral responses to show that we're getting antibodies produced. And 
though we did find protection against the diseases of interest, what we did find is where we had the knockout constructs against those putative immunomodulatory genes I mentioned, we did actually find we got quite severe reactions using a couple of these constructs. And so this still raises the point that even when you go for targeted approach of these sort of genes, it's very difficult to tell or predict what the phenotypic outcome will be because none of these genes work in isolation. This was quite interesting finding. And so we actually found that using the vaccine strain itself as vector was by far the more advantageous uh, vector to use. So what we've achieved and found so far is that we've had quite a few variants developed of these vaccines against Rift Valley fever for Southern Africa use with the Rift and PPR genes for other parts of Africa. We have constructs which have rabies glycoprotein, even constructs which have potential against CBPP in cattle. We have managed to get protection against goat pox, sheep pox, lumpy skin disease, PPR and Rift Valley fever. As mentioned now, you know, trying to induce or, or ensure attenuation using a field strain as a parental virus is not always easy and predictable. We have been working with our commercial partner, OBP, and we've transferred some of the cell lines for these constructs to them. And so this is looking very promising. We've also been involved with them with the vaccine formulation using their R&D processes. And we found we've got the constructs to be very stable. And so this is quite advantageous. What we're looking to do now is actual <laughs> additional funding for registration trials. And we're also looking at some alternative genes as ones to target for attenuation. And there's recent papers using the lumpy skin disease virus superoxide dismutase-like gene, which has shown a lot of good potential. And we're also looking at using so CRISPR Cas9 technology uh, to improve actually in the um, homologous recombination generation and selection technique. And with that, just here's a short list, as mentioned, of some of the papers, if any of you are interested, for further reading. And just like to really acknowledge CRDF Global for this kind invitation to present, our management and the wonderful research team that we have here at OVI, and just some of the funders over the years that have supported this work. But maybe most importantly is just to really thank the farmers who under very challenging conditions are farming these cattle and, and various livestock and to them really big thanks for, for the work that they do uh, in this respect. And with that I'd like to say thank you and if there are any questions I will try and hope to be able to answer them. Thank you very well, much. Thank you David, a very interesting presentation and uh, again uh, we have some questions that we'd like to address now and uh, we'll take the rest during the round table. Um, one of the questions was, do you think that lumpy skin disease seen in springboks uh, was acquired through contact with infected bovine or by insect vectors? Uh, this, is, this is a very good question. Uh, we're actually busy publishing a paper on, on this work. Um, there's quite a bit of controversy as to what's actually going on with, with the wildlife. And so, my suspicion uh, is that the virus possibly has a long-term maintenance of host, which is probably is a wildlife species. And quite a few of the different antelopes seem to, to indicate this possibility. Because the, the virus only appeared in cattle in 1929. And this was from the, the uh, indigenous farmers here and from the commercial farmers. They'd never seen it before. So the question is, where was the virus before then? And I'd say the, the obvious answer is probably in wildlife. And so we suspect that it is circulating probably at low level in wildlife. And, and so it, it, there may be the natural host for, for the disease, for the, the virus itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question was, as they're genetically very similar, why not use uh, GPV or SPV uh, as vectors as well? So, sorry, Mr. You're saying like the sheep and goat pox viruses, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well I know there, there is work in that respect going ongoing as well, especially in those countries which don't have lumpy skin mm -hmm. disease. Although nowadays, th th those number of countries are getting fewer and far between. So, yes, there, there is work in that respect. Okay. So, you put up a table of quite a number of uh, lumpy skin disease um, vaccines that are currently available. So, uh, what can you tell us about the duration of immunity seen with these different ones as compared to your vaccine? 
Well, this is also a very interesting question. There's again quite a bit of controversy about this. The immunity to, to the vaccination, especially well, Southern Africa, having for so many years had the, the Honest Put or the OBP vaccine, it used to be considered to be lifelong immunity. But then over the years, there the were problems started occurring where they reckon the immunity was not so long. And so then from those times, annual revaccination or boosting has been recommended. And, and as far as I know, that's still pretty much the, the recommendation, even for the other vaccines that an annual booster is administered. And I believe a lot of farming systems, it's actually more convenient just to revaccinate an entire herd. It's more practical than to think of just looking for those animals that may already have been vaccinated and then any new adults that maybe have been bought in or new calves when the right uh, four, six month you know, protection of, of colostrum antibodies for past and then susceptible and then to, to think of just vaccinating those. So pretty much across the board, annual revaccination. I think that's for most vaccines. Okay. Um, well, one last question before we go to the final speaker. Um, I see you mentioned that some of the uh, diseases that you're trying to apply your technology and vector system for was a CBPP. Do you, can you tell us anything about the antigens that you used that you vectored in your vaccines for this purpose and how well does it work? Um, sure. That, that, was a, that was a while ago. Um, I think if I remember, it was a, it was a T, TPA, uh, no, honestly, I can't remember exactly. There were two we were looking at. And uh, no, I honestly can't remember exactly which they were offhand. I'd have to go, go back and look them up. But I do know that they did not work particularly well. Um, I mean, TBP has been, you know, I was, I was aware it's been a big, big issue to, to develop a good, and there's been various, oh, a number of vaccine candidates but we, we did not have very good protection there on, in that way. That was about 12, 10, 12 years ago, we did that work. Yeah, I know that's been a tough uh, nut to crack. And so it's really <laughs> if you were. Uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, I said, I, I can't remember exactly which, which two genes uh, there were. No problem, no problem. Thanks. <laughs> well, again, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, now I'd like to turn to our final presentation. Thank you. So our, our final speaker <clears throat> is uh, David, I'm sorry. Uh, Dr. Christopher Broder, and unfortunately he is unable to participate live today, so he's pre-recorded his presentation and we'll share that with you momentarily. But as far as a little information about Dr. Broder, he's a professor and chair of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the Uniform Services University in Bethesda, Maryland. His expertise is in virus host cell interactions, viral vaccines and therapeutics developments, as well as serological assays for virus surveillance. And his current research focus is on uh, pathogenic Nipah and Hendra virus countermeasures, uh, their development and surveillance of zoonotic uh, viruses. And the title of his presentation is Nipah and Hendra, Next Generation Vaccines. Now, as we said before, you can leave questions, and I encourage you to do so in the um, Q&A box, and they'll be forwarded to Dr. Broder for him to follow up at a later time. So um, please do that also. So Haley, if you would please begin the presentation. Um, and it's a pleasure to, to give this presentation. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to do it uh, live for the meeting, but my, my brief presentation will uh, give you an update on what we've been doing um, as far as next generation vaccines um, against two uh, highly pathogenic uh, paramyxoviruses known as Nipah virus and Hendra virus. And what you see here on the slide in this, in this first box is really the, the transmission modes that we know about when we, when we talk specifically about Nipah and Hendra. On the left side was the first discovery of Nipah virus, which was in peninsular Malaysia. And what you see here is these viruses naturally exist in various bat populations uh, in many parts of Southeast Asia um, and Australia, and primarily teropus bats, so the large fruit bats. And what happened in Malaysia was that these bats found food sources, which were mango trees in Malaysia that were closely associated with high density pig farming operations. And the virus is actually shed in the urine of these bats and the contaminated fruit was consumed by pigs. And pigs, although many do get sick with Nipah virus, a lot of them don't overtly uh, get really ill, but they replicate a lot of virus. And what happened was the, the virus spread amongst different farms uh, and farm to farm via uh, virus production in an unknown fashion uh, from one farm to the next. But in addition to that, that virus um, also 
as a zoonotic virus also jumped from the pigs and people in, into people because they didn't understand what was making these pigs sick. Um, and there was a lot of confusion during this initial outbreak in which they actually thought it was Japanese encephalitis virus. Um, so the outcome in people, which finally uh, sort of uh, put the outbreak on the map was uh, a high incidence of encephalitis and, and fatal encephalitis. We're obviously having some technical difficulties and Haley is working on this and hopefully we'll be able to get this uh, presentation back on track momentarily. So please stand by. unknown fashion uh, from one farm to the next. But in addition to that, that virus um, also, as a zoonotic virus, also jumped from the pigs and people in, into people because they didn't understand what was making these pigs sick. Um, and there was a lot of confusion during this initial outbreak in which they actually thought it was Japanese encephalitis virus. Um, so the outcome in people, which finally uh, sort of uh, put the outbreak on the map was uh, a high incidence of encephalitis and, and fatal encephalitis. And at the end of the day, it turned out to be almost a 40% case fatality rate uh, in the pig farmers. And these were primarily men and, and older boys who were, who were the close caretakers of these pigs. But in the Malaysia outbreak also, it was quite interesting. If you go back and look at the literature, there were also ponies on some of the farms that had become infected and died, um, as well as dogs and cats. So this virus then was, was, was discovered um, and it it was discovered and it, it took about six months or so. And the reason it was discovered relatively quickly as a new Asian was because of what's happening over here on the other portion of this slide. And this is Australia. And this is the first discovery of these new viruses as, as a group known as the Hanipa virus genus. And what was happening in Australia was a new virus that spilled over from primarily black flying foxes in Australia almost exclusively from what we see into various horse, horses. Um, and some of the outbreaks were small, one or two horses, and some of the outbreaks were more significant. And when this first outbreak occurred in 94, um, it was again, this, the scenario of very ill horses with severe respiratory and, and sort of encephalitic syndrome um, on uh, in a small paddock area, about I think about 17, 17 animals under the care of, of Vic Rail. And he didn't know what was happening with these animals either. And what happened was he also became infected with endovirus by, you know, bare hand uh, husbandry taking care of these little animals. And, and Vic actually was the first known uh, case of a human, uh, uh, a human case of fatal disease. And half of the horses actually died outright and the others were so sick that they were euthanized. Well, anyway, it took a little bit of time to figure that virus out. And what it turned out to be was a new paramyxovirus and it was named hendrovirus which is the suburb in Brisbane, Australia, where the, where the outbreak had occurred. So what happens, happens in Australia since then is horses are the primary zoonotic target. There has been a couple of instances in which dogs have been infected on horse or farms where horses were also infected, just a few, two that have been in the literature. But then it's the veterinarians and the veterinary clinic workers are, uh, were the bystanders of becoming hendrovirus infected. And there's been four fatalities, a to total of seven cases. All right. And so since that time, we know that the virus exists in a lot of other places in the world, and particularly in Bangladesh, where we see almost annual outbreaks or spillover of Nipah virus. And Nipah virus evidence and in infection in cattle and goats and pigs in Bangladesh and also in India are now reported. Um, and this is almost a yearly incidence, and the virus there, we call it Nipah Bangladesh. Um, it's much more, from what we can tell and other researchers can tell, it's much more pathogenic virus. 
In some of those outbreaks, it's been a case fatality rate of, of, of 100%. Um, and then finally, this instance of in the Philippines, and, and this also appears to be NEPA, but maybe the NEPA Malaysia strain based on the genetic data. And this virus spilled over into horses, and some of those horses were consumed, and the meat was actually fed to cats and dogs. These animals got sick, and some succumbed and died from the infection. But we also had the virus transmit to people, probably in the process of preparing the meat. Um, and then also human to human transmission of NEPA virus in this instance. And if I hadn't said that in Bangladesh, that's one of the issues here is that Nipah virus can't spread person to person once an initial index uh, case is, is been reported, as many as five rounds. So it's, it's a significant issue. So these are emerging zoonotic, highly pathogenic viruses that which if you work with the live virus, you have to work in under biosafety level four conditions. Now, the virus over here in the corner of this cartoon shows you it's an envelope virus. And in the membrane of the envelope, um, we have these glycoprotein spikes, and there's two major glycoprotein spikes. Um, one is known as the G glycoprotein, which is involved in receptor attachment, and the other glycoprotein is called the F, which stands for fusion, and that glycoprotein mediates the merger of the viral membrane with the host cell membrane, and that's the initiation of infection. And the other, in the cartoon diagram that's shown here, we see two antibodies. These are FABs, but we actually made quite a number of different monoclonal antibodies to these glycoproteins. And, and the two that you see here, one specific for G and the other specific for F, these are neutralizing human or humanized monoclonals. And the one to G actually has was a human monoclonal that we made some years ago. And that actually is in uh, finished a phase one clinical trial in Australia. And it is really the only post-exposure therapeutic that's available now to treat tender and Nipah virus. And it's been used in, in at least 14 people um, since we developed it and provided it to Australia. The F antibody actually is quite interesting because this antibody actually binds to a site on F and prevents its conformational change. So we understand the mechanism of, of, of how these antibodies work, which is good when we try and think about them as going forward as a countermeasure. So why are these important? Well, these viruses, they cause a widespread systemic uh, multi-systemic vasculitis, all right? So they, they are tropic to the to receptor proteins on cells um, that are highly expressed in say the endothelial tissue, for example, in blood vessels and arteries. Um, so once the virus esta establishes an infection via the respiratory tract, it goes viremic and virtually every organ system is infected, but primarily it's the lung and the brain that are, are severe targets of virus replication and pathology. So the disease, the diseases manifested, for example, in people is encephalitis as well as a severe ARDS-like or, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. Now, in addition to Hendra and Nipah, there are three other now recognized Hendra viruses in the genus. One is Cedar virus, which I'll tell you about is the next generation vaccine that we've been working on. And this is a non-pathogenic Hendra virus, but it was discovered in Australia, again, from the urine of black flying foxes, right? And then we have Ghana virus, which is in West Africa, which was discovered by others. And the most recent is Mojiang virus, which was discovered in the uh, central South uh, Hunan province um, in China. And this, this one and Ghana are known only by genetic data. So there are no virus isolates for these, but there are full length genomes. So someone could rescue those to study their pathology. So we don't know, we can guess that they probably are pathogenic based on their genes that they possess, um, but we know that cedar virus is not, which is interesting. So getting back to the glycoprotein spikes, this is the dimer of G as a soluble protein. Well, the native structure is actually a dimer of dimers, it's a tetramer, and that's what this cartoon shows you here. And this soluble G we developed now 20 years ago, as a potential subunit vaccine for Hendra virus and Nipah virus. And it actually is the antigen form, the antigen within the vaccine known as Equivac Hendra virus, which is a licensed now vaccine for use in, in equine for horses in Australia, right? And in addition to that, over the years, we've actually shown that this recombinant subunit protein vaccine is 100% effective as a vaccine in preventing Nipah virus or Hendra virus infection in at least four different animal models, all right? So we know that it works in horses, but in the early days, we showed first that it protected in a, in a feline model, a cat model. We transitioned that, we know that it, it protects in a ferret model, it protects in hamsters, a hamster model, 
and it also protects the non-human primates. And actually, this Hendris SG pure protein as a recombinant subunit vaccine is now in phase one clinical safety trials uh, in humans sponsored by CEPI. So it's a single protein that actually is protective against both NEPA and HENDRA. So it works. So why does that get to cedar virus? Well, what we did some time ago now, a few years ago, is we took the genome of cedar virus and we were able to use reverse genetics to actually rescue the virus. Now, why did we need to do that? Well, because the original cedar virus isolate was actually discovered and isolated in within a biosafety level four lab. So you'll never be able to get that virus out, even if you show that it's not pathogenic. But what you can do with paramyxoviruses genetically is you can use a genome and you can use cell culture and by reverse genetics, you can rescue the virus. So we did that in biosafety level two because the virus is not pathogenic in ferrets or even monkeys and we haven't published that data. Um, and it's not pathogenic in hamsters either. So it's missing pathogenic genes that we know NEPA and Hendra possess. So why would you wanna do that? Well, you can then have a, an authentic HANEPA virus. It's a real HANEPA virus to study. You could study its virology or its cell biology, but then you can make reporters, for example, maybe reporter viruses with luciferase or GFP, and we've done that. And you can use it as a tool for drug discovery, for example, things that you could do at high throughput uh, screening libraries for antivirals, right? Well, the other idea that you can do is you can actually take the cedar virus, right, that looks like a cartoon like this, and you can replace its F and G glycoproteins with the glycoproteins of another pathogenic virus. And so we've done that, and we've made chimeras, and we've made chimeras of cedar that, that display the F and G of Hendra with GFP or luciferase, and we've made those that display the FNG of NEPA Bangladesh. Now, if you take these viruses, then they are really good tools because you now have a biosafety level two platform in which you can do serum neutralization tests, for example. So it doesn't, it, it allows you not to have to perform certain experiments with authentic NEPA or Hendra in biosafety level four conditions, which is restrictive and, and costs much more money. Now, in addition to that, and so that's the, sort of the idea here. You can see that the coloring is different. I put that down here as a chimeric virus. Well, why not take cedar virus, which is an authentic Hanipa virus, and then have it all, have all of its normal proteins there, but in addition to that, put in another genetic facet, which produces and secretes the soluble G glycoprotein, this protein here, which is the vaccine. Because in so doing, that you then have the potential to make a live attenuated vaccine vector. And so that's what we're looking at now as far as cedar virus goes. And we think that that might be a really important new sort of second generation vaccine concept, particularly in the agricultural settings. Um, because I, th I think that uh, the, the robustness of the immune response upon using such a virus as an attenuated vector uh, is intriguing. And I think we have, and we have some preliminary data already with the chimeras um, that it's quite effective in preventing a lethal challenge of either Hendra virus um, or NEPA Bangladesh. So that's really the next generation vaccines uh, that I envision for Hendra and NEPA. We've uh, written quite a number of re reviews in this area. We've been working on it for quite a long time. Um, and virtually every sort of platform that you can imagine has been tested you know, as a vaccine against NEPA. But the reason why we decided to go with a recombinant subunit protein now 20 years on was simplicity. And that's the reason why we chose that because a pure protein um, mixed with any one of a number or minimal adjuvant systems is probably one that's going to receive uh, the fastest track for evaluation uh, and approval as either an agricultural vaccine. Well, in that case, it was done for horses, but potentially also in humans because the formulation we're testing as a human vaccine is just with alum which is about as simple of an adjuvant formulation as you can get. So it's a prime boost strategy that we're doing there. Um, and the horse vaccine actually went from formulation and testing to limited field use approval in, in, in just two years in Australia. And, it, and the vaccine since then, which is uh, marketed by Zoetis, um, was uh, fully licensed in 2015, just a few, few years after that. So we feel we got a, a leg up on having a vaccine that's multi-purpose. In other words, tackling both the NEPA and Hendra virus issues. Um, and we have one in place and we have a, a new idea using cedar virus as a potential better or an improved second generation vaccine. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions um, from the moderator.
So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Brunner. I do have a, a few follow-up questions for you. Um, the first is, so since the soluble Hendra virus G protein works so well as a vaccine, both against Hendra and Nipah viruses in several animal models, uh, including non-human primates, and is also the basis of the approved Equivac Hendra virus vaccine for horses in Australia, why develop recombinant cedar virus as a vaccine? So that's a really good question. People have asked me that um, um, on many occasions. Well, the issue is that um, even even people that have horses that they want to get vaccinated, um, and then certainly most people they they like less sticks with the needle, right? So the way this vaccine works now, for the most part, and, and certainly in horses, is that it's a prime and a boost, and you got to do it. So it's two injections at least six weeks apart. And right now, uh, the recommendation in Australia is to get your horses boosted every year. Now, based on the serum neutralizing titers that we've seen in animals that have been vaccinated, I think that they will have a continual sort of look back at the data and reevaluate how often they might have to do that. Because one thing that I didn't mention in the case of Nipah and Hendra is that G protein, for example, is so effective because it has so many different neutralizing epitopes on it that we know that a, a serum, a pre-challenged serum neutralizing titer, which will afford complete protection from a 100% lethal challenge, say with Hendra or Nipa. If you assay the vaccinated animal subjects, if you have a titer of just one to 16, which is incredibly low, you still achieve 100% protection. So I think that um, perhaps not yearly, but perhaps two years, you might not even have, depending on the data as we go forward, you might not even have to boost the animals, but every three years, almost like a killed rabies virus vaccine approach. Um, I think that certainly has the potential. Now, the other thing is that cedar would afford you what we call a live attenuated vaccine platform, right? So it is a paramix of virus. It would be very analogous to how well the attenuated measles virus vaccine works or the attenuated mumps virus vaccine works. Almost 90% or greater protection with a single administration. Right. And you don't need any adjuvants either. All right. So one injection with a recombinant uh, uh, chimeric cedar virus that makes soluble G, for example, I think has the potential not only to provide for complete protection with one injection, but fairly rapid protection and uh, lifelong protection. Now, in, you know, in horses, whether or not people would would sort of buy into that, I think there's a good chance that that's possible um, because less injections and less cost is, is always better, especially, and horses are companion animals that live 20, sometimes 30 years or more, right? So there's a benefit there. Now, why is why does it work so well? Because it's live and it's attenuated and it's a balanced immune response. You get not only antibody response, which is what the Equivac subunit protein does, but you get cell mediated immunity, which we know is important, but we know much less about in terms of how protection, how, how what level of protection that affords against Nipah and Hendra virus. So all those things being said, I think that that is really the, 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 primary, the primary reason. That, and I still think that there's room also um, for other animals as a potential vaccine recipient, yeah. Interesting, fantastic, thank you. Uh, one other question for you, is a soluble G glycoprotein um, still the antigen of choice for a Nipah and Hendra vaccine? Yeah, so so one thing I alluded to when we talked about the, the, the two different spikes and we talked about the antibodies, if you compare with all the data that we and our collaborator, ha, collaborators have done, G is, G is a big protein and it's this dimer of dimers. And just on, the, on one head, one just one lollipop head of the four has it, as far as we know, has at least seven neutralizing determinants of which only one is where the receptor binds. So we know that there's neutralizing epitopes that have nothing to do with blocking virus entry, but that also block infection. More than likely, some of those block the, the entry mechanism because the way these viruses work is it binds through a receptor on G and then G turns around and triggers F 
to mediate the membrane fusion process. Now, if you contrast that to F, it's not to say that F won't work. People have done that and we have done it. F will work as a subunit vaccine also, um, but it's not as good. There's, there's much less numbers of neutralizing epitopes on F, right, than there is on G. So that's one thing. And then the other, from what we've seen, is the most potent neutralizing antibodies that we've made against F, they only recognize the pre-fusion form confirmation of F. And they actually lock it into its pre-fusion form. That's the mechanism. So if you wanted to make an F subunit, you would have to make it so that it stays in its pre-fusion confirmation in order to induce antibodies. So, and it can be done, but it's, you just have to do more things to it in order to make it a viable vaccine. Now, that's not, so the Hendra Nipah story, as far as F and G goes, is that vaccine antigen is not different from what we know about measles and mumps, for example. The data all show that the predominant neutralizing antigen to, to an antibody response in a human or an animal is to the attachment glycoprotein, not to the fusion glycoprotein, all right? So we'll stick with G and less is better, right? You could, you could use both together, but the more complex you make a vaccine, the more hurdles and things you have to do to show uh, that the formulation is the correct one in order to get licensure. Right, absolutely. Fantastic, well, thank you so much for your discussion. We really appreciate your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for the questions and happy to, and was really happy to be able to participate. So thanks very much, Haley. Okay, well, um, I want to uh, thank all today's speakers for very stimulating presentations. And I look forward to uh, hearing more about their work and their visions for the future of vaccinology during our roundtable discussion, which will take place after a short 15 minute break, which would, uh, let's see, get us back here at 11.06 Eastern Standard Time. So please come back at 11.06. Thank you.